got a big old RV and you want to visit the national parks, we can help. In this video, we're going to share with you the most important things you need to know if you have an RV and you want to visit the national parks. It doesn't matter if you're a full-time RVer or a weekend warrior, this is stuff that you have to know. Stick around to the end and we'll share with you the national park that has the biggest RV site. Bigger than you, than, than you're going to need. Yeah. I, I was, I was shocked. What's your favorite national park and why? Because we're looking to go visit some and we'd like to get some suggestions. So go ahead and post in the comments below. Do you know what the first national park was and when it was established? I do actually. In 1872, Congress established Yellowstone National Park. Ready for this? They used 1872 words. I love it. <laughs> as a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. Have you ever been to a pleasuring ground? <laughs> um. I guess it's in Yellowstone. <laughs> After that, the U.S. established more national parks and monuments, and in 1916, Woodrow Wilson established the National Park Service Act. And the rest is history. Thanks, Woodrow. The national park system now has about 467 sites. 467? Whoa! And that includes parks, monuments, huge recreation areas, rivers, lakes, preserves, and a whole bunch more. They have about 154 of those have camping sites and about 60, so how many is it? 63 have 63 actual. 63 have actual RV sites. Most national parks have designated areas for RVs. They're pretty RV friendly. If you're just visiting for the day, they've got big parking lots and places that you can turn around. However, some of them have size restrictions, especially if you're over 30 feet. So you might want to check ahead before you get there. Now, if you forgot to check ahead, if you get to the gate, they're going to let you know. And those should be a really good turnaround spot for you. We've never done that. Yeah, not, not even once. Now, we visited several national parks. We traveled across the country last year. We went from the west coast to the east and back. So we've seen a bunch of national parks. And this one here is one of our favorites. If you know what national park this one is you're looking at right now, go ahead and post in the comments below and don't cheat to see what other people have done. Just without looking at other commenters, just post what you think this national park is right here. We've actually been there twice. I loved it. And it I, was that good. And I want to go again. Should you take your RV and camp inside of national park? And the answer is, Absolutely yes. It's going to save you a lot of time on driving, commuting back and forth to the park, and it's a much better experience. Of the 63 national parks that have RV camping, only 36 of them have at least electrical, any hookups at all. Most national parks don't have any hookups at all. It's only good if you're, you know, boondocking or dry camping. So know that in advance and make sure that your rig is capable of being kind of self-contained. That's one of the reasons, you know, we stuck solar on there so we could like boondock for longer. We've done four days at a time with like no hookups at all. Nope, no problem. And there's a reason that many of these parks have no hookups at all for the RVs and it's Really, I love this reason, and it's really just to preserve nature. Yeah, the whole purpose of the national park system is to preserve a lot of the beauty, yeah. the original beauty of this country. And so there's there's no hookups. So when you go in there, know that you're visiting like nature as intended to be seen, preserved, not messed up by, you know, electrical and sewer and digging things up. The other reason is when they started making national parks back in 1872, most people weren't driving around with a dually and a 38 foot rig behind them. So they didn't, they didn't have the, the foresight. So these were made long, some, a lot of them in the 50s and 60s. So they just don't have any accommodations really for an RV. That was the era when people were first beginning just to travel and they'd kind of just picnic alongside the road in their cars, so not not. Yeah, it was way different in the beginning when cars started becoming super popular. As a means to travel. As a means to travel, yeah, when it was like more of a common thing and not just a novelty thing. It's like, oh, we could travel somewhere in our car and pitch a tent or sleep in the car or whatever. And right. they were kind of thinking like that. So it doesn't take a lot of space for a car or a covered wagon. Covered wagons? There's kind of a myth that says that you can't camp with your RV at a national park unless your rig is under 25 feet. And there's a little bit of truth to that because most of the accommodations are for smaller rigs, but literally over half of the national parks that have RV camping can accommodate rigs up to 40 feet in length. Now, when you get over 41 feet, that number drops down to something like 7%. Really low. And by the way, when they say overall length, they mean the overall length. Like if you've got a dually towing a trailer, you gotta add those together yeah. and figure what the total length is. And if you've got a class A motorhome and you're towing something behind it, the total length. So when you're looking at lengths, think 
total length. So let's see how long ours is. This is something that's been on our to-do list for a year plus. Now I've, I've guesstimated because the manufacturer, which isn't always accurate with the length of your rig, and your truck and all that, I've kind of guesstimated that our rig is 38 feet according to the manufacturer. And our truck is 22, but it overhangs six feet. So 22 minus six is what, 16? <laughs> Plus 38 is 54. I think it's gonna be about 54 feet from bumper to bumper. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I don't have a guess, so I'm just gonna measure. I always have to ask him every time what the guess is. There's a couple things that we probably should have done like a year and a half ago. One was to measure how long we are. We've actually never totally officially measured how tall we are. And we finally weighed the truck. If you ever wanna see about how to weigh your truck in your RV, there's a video like right, right, right there. 25 feet. You're 56 feet. Had no idea. We're also measuring from the back tires to the back of the rig to see how much overhang we can possibly have, and that's how much? Right about here. So we are at 10 and a half feet of overhang. That basically means that if there's space behind the bumper stop, we could probably get another 10 and a half feet. So we could probably fit into a 46 foot spot, which is still a pretty freaking big we spot. We fit into 40, so have we done it? You really also want to know how high your rig is, especially in our national parks. Sometimes there's bridges. And I think ours is 13 and a half feet. Let's see if I've been right. And do we need to add a little bit of extra for like where the air conditioner is? Oh yeah, I'm gonna measure that too. So I'm gonna go from here to the ground, then I'm gonna measure the air conditioner. So it's 12 feet, almost exactly, plus 14 inches. So it's 13 feet, two inches, including the air conditioner. So if it says 13 and a half, we're, we're golden. I know this is a video about the National Park, but I do have a side note. If you do decide to squeeze into a space like we've done many times, I'm the one that's watching when Trevor pulls in and I'm also watching where the jacks come down. Because if you are not watching as you're backing up one of those concrete things, you could wipe out your jack if it's too high. So be completely aware of where you are going to land when you hit those concrete stoppers and make sure that you know it's landing on the right space if you do back in. To find out if you fit and to actually book um, an RV site, a reserve an RV site, you go to recreation.gov. It's a great site. They've got a lot of information. It'll give you information even about Wi-Fi and other things there. The other thing that we found that we absolutely love is the National Park Services app and it's a great app even for a government entity. What I love when you go to recreation.gov is they have this grid so you can kind of do this big overlay and see what days are available because man, these parks are filling up really fast so it's a great tool to use and it's something that I use all the time when I'm searching. Another power tip, these national parks are often in very remote areas, thus yeah. national parks. And sometimes the internet's not going to really exist or cell service is going to be pretty minimal. But on recreation.gov and I think on the nps.gov app, you can see an indication of whether or not the cell service is pretty good. And for a better indication, on, on the website, they just show you just one little icon and it's generic cell service, good or bad. But if you go to an app like The Dirt, there's a link for that down below. It'll show you AT&T, Verizon, or Sprint. It'll show you an indication of how good the service is there. So especially if you're working on the road, you really want to know that information. Right. And The Dirt uses data that's collected from its users to, for input. And that's how they kind of collect that data. So it's a little more accurate than just a generic. Internet is is a big deal for a lot of people but there's one power tip that most people have never heard of but if you want to have guaranteed 100 megabits per second up and 100 megabits per second down anywhere in the whole country all you gotta do is hit like and subscribe it's it's <laughs> it's science what if you can't fit we've got a pretty good overhang so we can back our tires up as long as there's as we have open space behind us and that's how we've been able to fit in some of these really tight spaces so we've been able to also maneuver the truck a little bit sideways and everything else um our marriage had survived backing into some of these oh, really oh, small it's been, spaces it's been brutal backing up sometimes oh, yeah you just back up the wheels so the you know, cement bumper stops your yeah. butt will hang over a whole bunch and then sometimes you can cock your your truck in sideways in front so you can get a little more room but you got to watch out because there might be a little bit of you know 
grass, and some places don't like you parking and, on grass. And little, um, like, what did you hit? The other thing with that too, is sometimes they'll have overflow parking, and overflow park parking might be an extra fee. Maybe it's an extra seven bucks. So for us, where we can detach, we can detach and leave the RV. So if, the, if we back up, RV can fit in there, we pay an extra seven bucks, we got a spice. Every national park's gonna have other options just outside the park or even miles away from the park. So you can have commercial campgrounds and state parks and county parks. And one option we love is Harvest Host. There's a link for Harvest Host in the description below. Some of the, our favorite places we ever stayed are at Harvest Host. Yeah. But you can just stay at another park outside and take a shuttle, a lot of them have shuttles. And sometimes these other RV parks are literally just outside the national park right. itself. When we had all of our kids at home, we camped a lot with them. And we would go to the Sequoias, it was our favorite family tradition. Now we would go through the national park, but they would tell us if we were into the national forest that we could camp for free. And that's what we always did. We just always found a spot and pulled off and we were able to camp for free because it's national forest. What she's talking about is called dispersed camping. In the national forest and in BLM land, you can camp for free in a ton of areas. Use an app like The Dirt, which we mentioned before, to find out where those areas are. But there's a lot of dispersed camping available in national forests and in BLM land. And a lot of times it's immediately adjacent to the national parks. So it's not like a, a hard line or, no. or 50 miles away. It's like they kind of, you know, almost, almost they're right next to each other sometimes. You don't even realize that, oh, I am now in the national forest. It, it was a mystery for a long time for us, many, many years, but we always knew we were, okay, we're, we're safe here. So we, we just talked about that in our video. So you can check that out up here. Yeah, all about dispersed camping right up. Ding. There, oh, I think. I hit it. You oh. did. You pointed. You pointed really well. <laughs> Here's a power tip. As I was researching this video, I went and was trying to find some screenshots to show you what it looks like to book sites, and I was trying to find a, a national park that actually had sites free. And I'm like, nothing, nothing, nothing. Going months and months and months in advance. So what I'm telling you is that these things book up well in advance, especially if you're trying to go to Yosemite, a really popular one, they book up way in advance. So number one power tip is book well, well in advance. And number two, because the cancellation fee is so minimal, a lot of people go, well, I'm gonna be camping sometime in uh, March of 2022. So let me go ahead and book, block out these two weeks here and just, and just book it. The cancellation fee is minimal, so people will do that. So that's something you should probably do too if you're planning on being there and not sure the exact dates, just, just give it a few days leeway on either side and then just cancel the, the days that you're not using. But knowing that people do that, and you can do that too, there's often last minute cancellations and there's a killer app for finding when those are. I mean, one thing is you can just go on the website and just look every five minutes if right. you're trying to get there at a certain but time. There's a or, lot of people searching. A lot of people searching. Or you can use an app like CampNab and that will tell you, go, hey, I wanna to go to Yosemite National Park from this date to this date, let me know when a site opens up and bam, CampNab will alert you. CampNab is an amazing app, so you really wanna check that out because it will let you get in at the last minute. It works, it works really well. Now, CampNab doesn't book it for you, it's just an alert system, it tells you, hey, there's some openings available and some dates that you said you wanted to go. So you still have to go to recreation.gov and book it. And when you get one of those alerts, just go in because there's other people potentially oh, yeah. getting those alerts. But it is the way to find spaces that are open and it's way easier than trying to remember to check every day. We're gonna start doing something probably in every video called Gotta Have It. What's one thing you need for your RV that you gotta have? And usually it's gonna be pretty simple stuff. This one that we, I don't know why it took us so long to get them. We finally got these stupid headlamps. They're like, I don't know, 15 or 20 bucks strapped to your head. And you know, for the last 10 years, I've been using my phone for a flashlight, but these headlamps, A, they're 20 times brighter and B, they're on your heads, so you have your hands. And it makes it so much easier, especially if you're in say, a national park and there's no lights and there's a lot of tree cover and you're trying to get around. And when you left on a trail and we somehow got off the trail and it's dark and we're trying to on find On the way back, back, it's dark. It's like, hey, we've wandered around well, here and there once in a while, but now we got the headlamps. I kept saying it's this way. We were lost. Galen, whose fault is this? Your. A whole new world. New fantastic point of view. Boy, they have come in handy because 
There's signs we don't yeah. see it. It's in front of our face. Not <laughs> only for getting around inside a national park, but when you're trying to fix your RV, you're going to the yes. basement trying to fix leaks or whatever. It's, so many times. And that, and you know, if you're, we were like, phone's dying. Oh no, who's got a little battery power? These yeah. the best things So ever. if you don't have a headlamp, there's a link in the description. It doesn't matter which it was one. Like, I think I just ordered some more because we- You did. When we, I did. And they, they were like, 15 bucks for two, dude. So if you don't have one, like just pause it, pause, don't stop watching the video, pause it, open another tab, and order your headlights Best now or you're gonna forget. You when they arrive, be. you're gonna go, thank you, Leela. The entrance fee to most national parks is approximately 30 to $35, which is actually not bad. There's better, if you are going to be full time or if you're going to even just travel several times throughout the year if you're going to it's worth the investment in the america the beautiful pass it's 80 dollars, guys and it lasts a year so it's a full calendar year and you can buy it when you're going into a park and just grab it then or you can order online and if you order online what happens it's like 10 bucks and they'll mail it to you if you want to do something like that the america beautiful pass will get you into approximately 2,000 federal sites across the country, including the 400 plus national park sites. So it's totally worth it if you're gonna be traveling at all, especially if you're full time. Now there are other passes which have varying degrees of discount or even free, including a military pass, an all access pass, a volunteer pass, a fourth grade pass, and wait, I gotta look at the other one. Oh, and a senior pass. So if you think you might fall into one of those categories, it's worth looking into it. For more information, we made a video about how to get into parks for free and that video is right up there. Here's some power tips, things that you need to know, starting with this one. This is an ironic one for us because if you've followed us in our journeys, you know that the most that we've ever had planned in advance was 10 days. That was it. That's a and, idea. Yeah, we 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 like to just kind of go with the flow. Honestly, in order for us to get to Yellowstone, which we haven't been there, and it's because of this. It's because it just is harder for me because we have to plan in advance. We talked about why you need to plan to get a reservation in advance, but the other thing you want to do is make sure you plan your tours in advance because sometimes those book up as well. Tours and other activities in the park, plan all those in advance. I've already kind of alluded to kind of how we like to travel and it's one of our power tips. And it is really when you get to some place, how to take your time. Yeah, we may be going to the seashore, which we did in the, in the Gulf and I loved it. And it was wonderful to see that, but there's honestly, most of the time around one of these national monuments or something, there's so many other things to see. There's so much to explore, usually you're next to um, national forests or trails or hiking trails. And one of the things that we always do is we will just ask somebody. We almost always talk to the ranger or a park host. Those guys are great resources. So take your time and find out other places to go. Another tip is to Consider going in the off season. There are very popular times to go to all of these national parks and monuments and sites. Go in the off season if you can, and you're gonna have a better chance of actually booking a site. And there's gonna be less people around. It's gonna be a more enjoyable experience. You can also consider going during the non-peak time during the day. So early in the morning, late in the evening, whatever, it's gonna be a better experience for you then. Another tip is some of these national parks allow you to book first come, first serve. When you go on to the website and you see that grid Leela talked about, in fact, here it is right here. Over here it says FF, that means first come, first serve. So look for those if you want to try to get into a park last minute. Now there is a thing to note with um, going off season. Some of these parks actually do shut down because of seasonal weather. If you're trying to book and you're like months and months and months and there is nothing, you may actually see if maybe you know, from October to March, maybe they're closed for that season. We have traveled to places many times off season. We've gotten caught in the snow. We've gotten caught in um, some crazy weather, but as a result, we've been the only one sometimes exploring. We were in the Grand Isle, which is a barrier island in Louisiana. It was one of our favorite places. I think there was, what, four other people there and no one else on the beach. I'm super curious about this because I haven't researched it and, um, Maybe we'll go, which one has the biggest RV sites? The campground with the biggest RV sites in the entire national park system is Big Meadows Campground in Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. We haven't been there, but they have sites that'll accommodate rigs up to 100 feet. That's even more than, than we need. Who has 100 feet? I don't know. But hey, 
I don't think we have any problems getting into the space. Maybe that would be nice for us for one. Yeah, it'd be easy. Oh, it's a pull through. I could. Oh, pull it's a pull through. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, if it is, I don't know. that would be helpful. Yeah, I think we could even back into that one probably pretty easy maybe, too. Maybe even you could back into it. Hey, I, what do you think? Should we travel there and I'll back into we that with you soon? If you think we should travel to Virginia so Leela could practice backing into a big old site, Post in the comments below. To see all the ways you can camp for free in national parks, click on that video right down there. YouTube thinks you want to watch this video right here. Hit subscribe so you catch all of our future adventures. We can't wait to share our adventures with you.